welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, again, I'm a new instructor at the Center for Alternative Photography, which is connected to the Penumbra Foundation, which is dedicated to photographic education. In the Center for Alternative Photography, its primarily focus is teaching the 19th century methods of photography via workshops. Most of those are weekend workshops. Everything from daguerreotype to tintype, cyanotype, gum broke by chromate, Rome oil is next week, etc. I have a art history degree from the University of Oregon, 1994. Um, I've been working in with museums and galleries since 95, and specifically in the photography marketplace since 1998, uh, managing a photography gallery as well as other galleries. Um, ten years ago, I got my credentials to appraise fine art from the NYU Appraisal Studies Program and am one of 12 people certified in the country to appraise fine art photography. Um, I am, have just moved out here from Portland, Oregon because I've decided to go back and get my master's in art history specific to photography history. So um, I am new to your town and relishing every single moment. <laughs> What I'm going to illustrate today is avenues in which you can expose your work to, again, gallerists, curators, photo editors, and potentially collectors. Um, because why make it? <laughs> so most, most of my resources are online. Um, let me get to the right one. Okay. So one of the best things that you can do is um, through portfolio review conferences. This is um, quite extraordinary to photography in the sense that um, portfolio review conferences like Houston Photo Fest, which happens every other year um, in spring of Houston. Um, there is Photo Lucida in Portland, uh, which happens in rotating years. So when Houston Photo Fest was 2012, Photo Lucida will happen in 2013. Um, and continuing. The Fresh Look Art Fair, um, which is connected with the month of photography in LA, that's also in April, that is annual. There's the Palm Springs Photo Festival, which I recently learned now has an avenue here in New York happening in October. And also Lens Culture, which partners with Houston Photo Fest, now has a Paris arm, usually right before Paris Photo Fair, which is usually the first or second weekend in November. What's extraordinary about these is you have the opportunity to literally sit down with national to international curators, photo editors, gallerists, um, freelance curators as well as institutional curators um, and people like myself and one of the things that I do is I'm advisor to a new photography gallery in the city of Dubai um, so I do look for work that's relevant to that mission statement which is has to do with photography of the region Considering how difficult it is to get access and how inundated particularly curators are, this is pretty remarkable. Um, you usually get 15 to 20 minutes. You sit down just like here uh, with the individual and you show them your portfolio. Because you have such a constricted amount of time, it is extremely important that you go prepared in the sense that you want a edited portfolio, you wanted to make sure that you have your strongest work 
It's good to have a series, something that shows consistency as opposed to the highlights you've done over the years, which can be somewhat random. Um, because as my colleague Ellen Bond says, who's a stock photography strategist, memory is usually associated with the worst image and the last image. So make sure your worst image is one of your best. Um, and also remember that you are not always your best editor. You're very close to your work. You're often very emotional about certain pieces. So if you have someone you trust who can sit down with you and go through your portfolio, your images to help you cull it down and refine it, that is to your advantage. Also bear in mind that you are schlepping <laughs> your work and possibly sitting down with anywhere from 30 to 40 people in the course of four days. One, you're going to be extremely exhausted emotionally and physically. So you want to be able um, to manage your portfolio. In some cases, uh, I know photographers who have done small portfolios and then had a large example of their work, particularly if they tend to print in large format. Um, that way they can show the individual, you know, what traditionally, you know, their work looks like or how they prefer to, it to be presented without, again, you having to lug around 30 by 40 inch prints, which is not telling. And also um, bear in mind that they're going to be handled. Um, depending on how you wish to orchestrate it when you're at the table with the individual. Um, you, generally speaking, I prefer to ask the artist, how would you like to present this to me? And either the artist will scroll through in a very specific order and give me a monologue about the series or the work or the impetus. And in some cases, they ask me to just go through at my pace and take it in as is without commentary. Um, and that's really up to you. It's also good to be prepared with regards to what you're going to say. Um, it's not always easy to talk about your own work. Um, but again, you have time is very, very precious. You're in a room with probably anywhere from 40 to 50 individuals. Um, it's loud, lots going on. The other thing as well, um, take cards, take collateral, <laughs> take something to leave. Um, curators and gallerists will take things with them. The most important thing you can do beyond that initial contact is follow up. Follow-ups are paramount. Be persistent without being a pest. That is one of the other things that you want to be aware of. Um, and you can do that depending on the curator or the gallerist. You can do it by email. You can do it by postcard. Send them your exhibition cards. Again, they are looking at anywhere from 60 to 100 portfolios in the course of four days. Um, there is, these are also expensive. Most of these cost, I believe, plus or minus $800. Um, that expense covers the cost of getting the reviewers to one central location. And again, you know, these reviewers are from all over the country, so in a sense, it's much easier than traveling to LA, Houston, New York, and Paris. But it is an extraordinary cost, not to mention your expenses. Um, there are some resources. I don't know. I believe New York um, probably has a, a regional arts council where you can apply for professional development grants. I do know photographers who have applied for those grants in order to pay for the fee and their expensive for these events. Um, so that is a way to help you, you fund it. There is also critical mass. I'm very sorry that registration is closed. 
this is a cheaper way to again, get your work reviewed by probably three times as many reviewers as you would at a portfolio review conference. This is remote. It is digital. The way that it works is that you submit a portfolio of 10 images via their website. Um, they probably get anywhere from you know, plus or minus 800 submissions. There is a pre-screening process, um, and I don't envy those individuals who go through those 800 portfolios in the course of a month and a half. But then those pre-screen portfolios then come to me and my colleagues, and we receive a disk or a website link. And then over the course of anywhere from eight to 10 weeks, I sit down and review 200 portfolios. And we rank those, we actually vote. Um, the winner gets a, a book, gets a published book with a partner. Um, at one point, they were doing a traveling exhibit. What's really nice about this organization, um, this remote conference, if you will, is called Critical Mass. And it is every other year. I encourage you to sign up for the newsletter so that you get the next notice of when registration comes up again. Um, the umbrella is Photo Lucida. And again, nonprofit organization. It's based in Portland. The executive director of Photo Lucida, her name is Laura Moya. I can't say enough wonderful things about her. She has consistently vetted reviewers and refreshed the uh, list of reviewers to ensure that the people who are coming and sitting down with you are offering opportunity. It's not just a free trip for the gallerist or curator. They need to come with a show, group exhibit, you know, representation, what have you. So bear that in mind. They are looking at your best interest and benefit. Um, so that's, and Houston Photo Fest as well is also, this is a month long festival exhibits throughout the city. Um, I believe they, they break up the portfolio reviews. You, you sign up for very specific weeks or sessions. That way they can get more people in. I have heard extraordinary positive feedback from the artists who have gone to Houston Photo Fest. Sometimes it's gallery representation. Sometimes it's an exhibit. Sometimes it's work that's been purchased by a collector. So I consider this the goal. You know, if you haven't done a portfolio review conference before, I encourage you to try and do one locally first, just so you can get your feet wet and understand how it works. If any of you are associated with ASMP, the New York chapter, I actually was fortunate enough to be invited to be one of their reviewers this past February. Um, so there are those small conferences locally that you can get, again, your feet wet so you can then step up to <laughs> the next level. All right, so another way, and if you're looking specifically for galleries, you shop for a gallery in the same way that a gallerist shops for artists, in that you want to select a gallery who shows work that is in the vein of yours. So for example, if you do exclusively studio still life work, you're not going to approach a gallery that shows almost exclusively architectural work. That's not their clientele. That's not you know the audience that that they attract. So, um, but you also do not want to be in competition, in direct competition with another artist already in the stable. You know you want to be complementary and in the same vein, etc. So you know just be very conscientious about that when you're looking at galleries. It is of course always um, appealing to shoot for you know, the most prestigious blue chip gallery, um, but you want to build your resume. One way to 
do sort of one-stop shopping in terms of the galleries that are out there and active is to go to art fairs or fo photo fairs. So I don't know if any of you have been to APAD, all right, which is the, APAD stands for the Association of International Photography Dealers. Um, and they, in the spring, every year, they've actually, they're now in the armory, they have a photo fair. It is open to the public and each gallery gets their own booth um, and they set it up with, with their photographs. So you can walk through, and, and these are generally classical, modern, contemporary galleries in terms of aesthetic. Um, most of them have been in business for plus or minus 20 years. Um, but there are some younger galleries in there as well. If there is a lull, it's appropriate to introduce yourself to the gallerist please do not take up more time than necessary. It is an extraordinary cost for them to be at an art fair, and the paramount thing is making new clients and selling artwork. So the last thing you want to do is interrupt that process. And you're also, you know, if you're represented by that gallery, you want your gallerist to be selling your work. So um, just, you know, be very aware of the situation you're in. Um, but it's not inappropriate to, to leave your card. Um, it isn't inappropriate to take up their time if you're not interested in acquiring work. Um, if what you're trying to do is solicit their attention for representation. Um, so aside from APAD, there's a lot of new photography fairs coming up. There's a brand new fair in Tokyo if anyone is traveling. Um, Milan, there's a new one in Brussels. The Unseen Art Fair is associated with foam, which champions new work, truly new, young, untested work, so to speak. Um, also here in the U.S. is Photo LA. Um, that's been around for 20 plus years. Uh, it's usually in January, and it also is another opportunity um, to see a lot of galleries, mostly U.S. galleries. You will see more international galleries at APAD. Um, and one of my very favorites is Paris Photo, which um, I've been fortunate the last couple of years to work at Paris Photo um, with my Dubai gallery. It is the best. <laughs> <laughs> they, you really have a truly international scope, um, US, Europe, um, the Far East, and you're starting to get the Middle East, obviously. Um, and it's also booksellers. Um, they've and as you just noticed, there was an Aperture Book Award. So the other thing to, to notice about the art fairs is if you're with a gallery that shows at an art fair, it demonstrates that they're getting your work in front of, of an audience outside the usual demographic. That's a big plus. Um, and you know, probably also demonstrates that the gallery is in, in a financially healthy state, because again, these are very extraordinary um, in terms of cost. Some of these also fairs provide prizes, like um, Paris Photo has partnered with Aperture for a book prize. Um, there's a, another fair event um, in, I want to say Toronto, um, that's called Contact. And they have, let me see, here it is. Um, they've partnered with BMW, and there's the BMW prize. It used to be a $25,000 purse, which is a big deal. Um, and the way you even get submitted to this prize is that the participating galleries in the fair um, are asked to submit 
artists work for the competition. So it's via the gallery that you get in um, and then into the competition and then usually they have a very prestigious um, jury selection and it looks nice on your resume, not to mention the money. Um, so that's another advantage with art fairs. Um, so this segues into the photo festivals. Um, some of these photo festivals, this one again is in Toronto. There's another one in Montreal. Let's see, this one is in Montreal. One of the biggest ones is in Arles. Um, many of these fairs, the artist makes a submission and has opportunity to show their work. It does depend on if they've hired a curator. Um, for example, with the Montreal Fair, they've actually hired Paul Womble, who's doing the theme of drone photography. So that sort of puts all of you at a disadvantage, unless anyone in here is a drone. Um, so some of them are more conceptual, but something like Arl is extremely well attended. It is prestigious. Um, it, I mean, there's almost no bad, really. Um, so bear in mind that there are the, the art fairs as well. This is a triennial in Hamburg. And locally, if any of you went to Photoville, did anyone go to Photoville in June? <coughs> so this is um, sort of a grassroots organization here in New York. And it also had, well, it had tents set up. It was, it was right by the Brooklyn <coughs> Bridge in the park. Um, and so there were organizations like the Center for Alternative Photography, but also artists had containers that they could show their work. Um, and it had very good attendance. Um, the weather, of course, was a bit of a battle, but so there is this opportunity as well. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you show me Milan and Tokyo one? The Milan, sure. Here's the Tokyo. And if anyone would like these email, these uh, website addresses or the list of all these websites, just leave me your uh, email address here and I'd be happy to send you the list. Um, not all of the website addresses are, are logical. <laughs> okay, and then this is the Milan. Awards. <laughs> okay. I cannot reiterate with any more emphasis, um, you are your own best advocate. Whether you're represented by a gallery or not, things happen because you make the effort. Um, even if you're with a gallery, you are still responsible for promoting your work. You, know, you got to remember that a gallery is representing anywhere from 20 to 35 other artists. So you get the attention when you're having a show. <laughs> and then the next person gets the attention when they're having a show. So you do work in tandem with your gallerist um, as to next steps or what's appropriate. So awards are also fall in that, in that you do the application. Um, awards are not only prestigious and resume builders, sometimes they have purses um, and they can make you more attractive to a gallery or a curator or get their attention if they previously haven't been aware of your work. One of the things that I recommend to artists is when you're looking or considering a competition, and again, these usually have an entry fee. Sometimes it's dependent on how many images you submit. Um, 
those dollars can add up very, very quickly. So be choosy about which uh, you're going to enter. And usually I recommend choosing by the curator or juror you want to get your work in front of. So if you want to get your work in front of Karen Sinsheimer from the Santa Barbara Museum, that's where you should submit to. Um, I have one wonderful example. Um, an artist I work with, Jim Lomason, had uh, entered a competition and the then ph photography curator, the Stieglitz uh, curator at the Philadelphia Art Museum, she had chosen his work as um, you know, first prize or what have you. And subsequently, she kept his card. And with follow-up, she later, she wasn't able to acquire a piece for the Philadelphia Art Museum, but she passed on a recommendation to a local nonprofit, which then gave Mr. Lomason a full-blown exhibit in Philadelphia. They flew him out, took him out to dinner. He said it was like one of the nicest experiences and he got a show out of it. Um, so you never know. You just never know when you hit the trigger and you and you got to remember that most of these curators, especially if, you know, Sandra Phillips at SF MoMA, Ann Tucker who just retired from Houston, you know, these people, many of them have been curators for 35 plus years. So their network is extraordinary and their memory is pretty good too. So um, things can happen beyond that particular juried event. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed with some of these juried prizes um, is this is the uh, PIX award in Paris. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a limitation on what country you apply. Um, there are famous and renowned photographers who are often the jurors, and that's wonderful. But more often than not, you know, the benefit will be if they give you the prize, not if they give you a show, which they can't do. So, um, you know, that's, that's something to bear in mind as well. And that's also applicable to portfolio reviews. Um, if you sit down with a fellow photographer, you're probably going to get critiqued, um, which may not be why you want to be there, um, as opposed to finding a possible avenue for your work. So this is another, this is the Gala Awards. This is a very interesting site in that they have, where is it? Oops. They have rotating, um, see like here's one juried by Steve McCurry. Um, very nice man. Uh, so, so this is a list of the different awards, like the Julia Margaret Cameron Award registration or submission just passed. So this website has quite a few different awards, um, so it's a good one to pay attention to. Um, another, another one I didn't pull up um, is the, the Duke University Center for Documentary Studies. They um, hand out the Dorothea Lange Paul <laughs> Taylor Prize. Um, if any of you are familiar with that, it's a very prestigious prize. Um, that one, you know, you want to pay attention to the submission guidelines because um, that prize is when a photographer and a writer have coordinated for a very specific project that's usually, you know, of social importance. So pay attention to that sort of thing. This is, um, I always go back to my Portland roots. So the Region, Regional Arts and Culture Council has a grant search uh, feature. And you can narrow it by your location or your discipline. 
And as you can see right here, the Aaron Siskin Foundation is currently uh, open for submissions. Ah, sorry. Um, I get this through RAC, R-A-C-C dot org. And it's usually right under grants. It's the very last selection. So it's very, very easy to find. Um, here locally, you have the Foundation Center. Are and anyone familiar with that? Foundation Center down. No, this is just called the foundationcenter.org. They have a office right off of right off of um, thank you Union Square um, so what's great about them now this this nonprofit organization is dedicated to nonprofits um, in terms of surface uh, services and assistance and seminars however if you go into the Union Square office they have a library with computer consoles that give you access to their entire database of grants, fellowships, and scholarships, which again, some are available to artists and individuals. If you go through their um, website, there is a fee. Um, it's usually a, a monthly subscription. There may be a different option as well, but there is a service fee if you go through the website. Whereas if you just go to the office downtown, you can use it for free. Um, your local library as well also has wonderful resources if, if you're looking for dollars. Um, Foundation Center? Yeah. And they're right off Union Square. Um, another thing that people have been using, let me see if I have it up already, is Kickstarter to raise money. This has become very, very popular. Um, it is campaign oriented. If any of you, well, first, you, your project gets vetted um, through their organization. Can't be conceptual. You have to, in the sense that you can't be wanting to put together a website. Um, but as artists, as working artists who produce photographs, you are definitely eligible. That's what they encourage is, is creative production. Um, and I've seen quite a few photographers take advantage of this organization in terms of fundraising, whether it's for a specific project or they're raising dollars to publish their book. Um, so it's great. You can do a 30-day, 60-day, or 90-day campaign. Um, I spoke to an individual, um, actually is a former head of the Department of Art History, who did started smarthistory.org, and he did a campaign through this to help raise money to do videos. Um, and one of the things he said is he encourages a 30-day campaign because you want to keep the momentum, which means you need to Twitter and you know send out press releases and you know keep the energy flowing. And also, you know, the longer you wait, um, kind of people tend to forget. <laughs> so this is also, but also the other deal as well is. You set the dollar amount of your goal, and if you don't make your goal, you don't get any of the money. If you make your goal and anything above that, you get you get the dollars for your project. So, you know, you're not you're not guaranteed the dollars that come in, um, but that is another option as well. With regards to um, resources, the many of you are probably familiar with Photo Eye Books. It's um, exclusively devoted to photography books and monographs located in Santa Fe. 
Um, they do often participate in photo fairs as well. Um, but they have this new guide. They partnered with Nazraeli Press. And through this site, you can look up galleries, associations, book publishers, festivals. Some of these are dead links. So do double check. Um, I went through and, and verified some things. Um, this site was done a couple of years ago, and it's not as up to date as one would like. Um, so do, do verify things. Um, but it could, it could get you some information that you might want. The other thing, too, is PhotoEye actually has a online gallery. Um, and you can submit, they, um, you submit a portfolio, they put it online, they have a, a database, um, so that's another opportunity in addition to the physical gallery. They don't actually represent artists, um, so it's a constant rotation. and. When it comes to nonprofit galleries, that is another opportunity. Uh, like one of another very prestigious gallery, again, I'm going back to my Oregon roots here, is the Blue Sky Gallery. And its champion is Chris Rauschenberg, who many of you may know. He is the son of Robert. Um, but also a um, well-known photographer in his own right. Um, he and some, some colleagues started Blue Sky over 30 years ago. It is probably one of the more prestigious nonprofit photographic galleries in the country. They um, have a brand new, well, it's three years old, um, but a relatively new gallery space that's absolutely stunning. Um, and this Many events during Photo Lucida are held at Blue Sky. It is submission. Um, they have very specific guidelines on, on submission. And also bear in mind that it's juried in the sense that they have a review committee. So it's by committee. Um, they tend to be um, interested in social and environmental work. Um, they're starting to kind of break that envelope a little bit and get into more conceptual work. So look through, see what they've been doing. They do tend to be experimental. It is volunteer-based, so sales are not extraordinary. Um, but they do, they do happen. And they also have uh, artist lecture series um, associated with any of the exhibits they're having. For other gallery sources, are you familiar with Photograph Magazine? It's actually a local publication. I have a copy here. It's just um, photographmag.com. So this is an advertising venue exclusively for photography galleries and venues showing photographs. So it is, again, we're back to the one-stop shop of who's showing what and where. Um, so this is also a very nice resource. And majority are here in town, which is very nice. Another listing that I subscribe to, this has an e-newsletter. So I get oh, almost daily um, international um, notices for exhibits, both at galleries and institutions. Um, it's not generally artist, singular artist specific, um, but it will let you know what's happening where, which is kind of nice. And something I learned about recently, um, so some of you may know about artdeadlines.com, which is uh, another place where you can learn about grants, fellowships, competitions, etc. 
Well, they started putting effort into this artist to artist social network. Um, I have a couple of friends who are photographers who joined this association, if you will. Um, I can't join because I'm not an artist. And what they do is when you submit work, it actually gets reviewed and juried. And if you get a certain number of votes, you can be um, profiled or highlighted on the home page, uh, which is nice. And apparently the curator of the site, after reviewing your work, will make recommendations of who you might want to submit to. So one artist I know goes by her recommendations almost exclusively. Um, I have an other artist who's a little more freeform in terms of, of experimenting with who to submit to. So this is another potential um, resource for figuring out where to submit your work. And is anyone um, stock photography? Okay, I see at least one yes. <laughs> this is my colleague Ellen Bond who um, she's been in the business for over 35 years. She had a stock agency in the 80s, sold it off right before the digital revolution. Um, she was one of the earliest um, advisors to Corbis and is now a stock photography strategist. Um, she's also written a book on mini stock photography. Um, so if anyone is looking to refine their portfolios uh, for added revenue with regards to stock, um, she's your lady. The book that she wrote, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, uh, that's not it. Ah, the book. Um, this little book she wrote is displeased some of her colleagues because apparently it um, eliminates the middleman where the artist can, can basically source their work directly to the client, um, those who are using stock. In the portfolio reviews that you do, uh -huh. how do you pr prefer um, the presentation? Do you prefer loose prints, left side, down? Galleries, how do you actually approach the gallery in okay. a way that will get you? Okay. The, the first thing you should do is, um, well, I'll, I'll go back to your question first. I'll put up the center I'm promoting. Um, so, with regards to how to assemble your portfolio for portfolio review, I would say all of the above. Because again, I am, I'm one of the reviewers. I want you to present it to me the way you prefer it be seen. Um, so if you prefer a folio, you know, where each print is in a sleeve, that's just fine. If you have matted prints, that's just fine. If you have loose prints, if you want to show me, um, you know, just a, a book with images in it and then have one large print on the side saying this is how it's normally shown. I've even looked at portfolios on iPads. Um, I don't recommend that <laughs> because one of the disadvantages to the digital platform is it's at 72 dpi and it's about this big and it doesn't represent the physical piece and craft is as important as the image as far as i'm concerned how many images for portfolio review i would say Plus or minus 15. Um, if you have two bodies of work that are very, very strong, do two tens. 
If you have one really strong body of work that's probably in the 15 to 20 range, I wouldn't go more than 20. Um, have that, that primary series, but do include a couple of extras from another series because one of the things that I like to see is consistency in the sense that you are consistent from one body of work to the next body of work that you know demonstrates to me your technical skill, your vision, your aesthetic, etc. Rather than, you know, these are my 12 great images that I've done over the last 12 years and which shows my ratio. Um, and those can, can be very random. Um, also, make sure they're all printed the same. Again, that's part of the consistency. I think that's very important. You know, oftentimes I will see things that were printed in different decades. And if it's a discrete body of work that was all printed, you know, in 1980, fine, great. But don't have a mixed bag of, you know, different prints from different times for the same series. It's kind of rough. That's me personally. Um, you know, it's, you know, you, again, it's an extraordinary opportunity and you've got 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> when you go to that, to a portfolio review, uh -huh. is it with the idea of getting a critique for your work or is it with the idea of getting that person to be kind of your connecting link to somewhere else? For most people, they want the latter. There are, um, when, um, I actually have been reviewing for Photo Lucida for 10 years and reviewed for it in its prior incarnation, which was called Photo Americas. Um, in that prior incarnation, they made it as inexpensive as they possibly could and it was extraordinary the number of 101 students I saw. And it's like, <laughs> you really need a little bit more under your belt. Um, they are bringing in professionals, professional individuals in the industry. And more often than not, most of the people, again, they're looking for gallery representation. They want an exhibit. They want their work reproduced in a magazine. The photographers that have come to me and complained about their review was because the reviewer just critiqued their book, uh, or actually tried to edit their book, which was already published, which <laughs> it's like, it's done. Um, you know, or critiqued their portfolio, and they're like, well, that's not really helpful. Um, so, you know, and that one of the things you find with Photo Lucida, for example, um, there's, there's two options. I mean, you as a participant, you sign up, you do your due diligence. Absolutely. You do your due diligence and you research every one of the people who's coming to that review conference. So I'll just pull up Photo Lucida really quick. And so on this site, you can go to the reviewer list. Reviewers, okay. All right. It's a nice list. They are not live links. You need to do your homework. You need to go to those institutions and you need to see the kinds of things that they're showing. All right, so that's your preliminary homework. Prior to the portfolio conference opening, you put in your top 20 reviewers. And the algorithm democratically filters through and you get your choices. Um, more often than not, there's going to be a few people on your list. You're like, I don't think I chose this person. You know, it's an experience. Um, so one of the things you will discover, and you'll discover it on the first day, these conferences are also networking opportunities with your colleagues, with your fellow photographers. 
and you will meet people that you will have connections with and keep in touch with and see at another portfolio review conference. What also happens, especially that first day and subsequent days, is that you learn who's being helpful as far as reviews, who's giving opportunity, who's being kind of blasé, who is being a bit of a jerk. Um, you will find out the personalities of the reviewers and the kinds of information that they're giving and again the opportunities they're offering. So talk to your co-participants because they will also help you um, interface you know with your next portfolio review. Sometimes you know you will find out that the person you have next white gloves only or they don't want to touch anything um, you know and that's personality you're dealing with individuals um, so that's that's a big factor um, so getting back to photo lucida I'm usually not on this list even though I'm a reviewer in part because all these people are in the ballroom with the table it's you the banquet table, the reviewer, and the clock, and 50 other people around you. The cacophony of <laughs> the atmosphere is a little unnerving. Um, and what Photo Lucida started doing, and, and I started this because I was in limbo. I wasn't representing a gallery at the time, and I was an independent dealer and couldn't really provide an exhibit opportunity for artists. So they started the lounge. And in the lounge, it was actually literally a lounge with tables and water, and you could, you know, photographers could have a respite between sessions. And I would go in there and I'd have a badge. You know, mine was a different color, and it said Jennifer Stoops. And the first day I met with two people, the second day, I met with 10 people, and the third day I had a line waiting for me. And what was nice about that is um, that first day, those two people told the other participants the kinds of things that I talk about. So as a consequence, the people who came to talk to me, they wanted, they wanted that kind of advice, and at that time, I was sitting down with this and their work and saying, all right, you should consider approaching this gallery. Keep in mind that this dealer is very particular about X, Y, and Z, you know, so you want to do this, but you definitely don't want to do this. So I was giving them a guide of who they might want to approach. And then again, you know, as each day progressed, it was, you know, it was it was nicer for me, um, not only because the people who came to me wanted to hear the kinds of things that I could help them with, but also if it was someone who there just, you know, wasn't really a click, I wasn't sure how I could help them. Um, we met for five minutes and it was very nice to meet you. Um, with someone I was very engaged with and had very interesting work, I would sit with them anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes. I didn't have a clock. So that was, that was a much more free and comfortable way. Um, but it was also hard to, to cut people off, especially when I had the line and it's six o'clock on Sunday and we're all going to dinner and there's four people waiting for me, which I'm more than flattered, but I couldn't, I couldn't meet with. What about the second question? I'm sorry, the second question. About, I guess it was about approaching the gallery. Oh, okay. Yes, so, uh, yeah, the real, the real approach. First off, <laughs> read their website. Most galleries have submission guidelines. Some of them literally, as some of you may know, will only accept admissions during the month of August. So you better get on it um, and they have very specific um, guidelines in terms of what format 
you know, if it's JPEG, if it's via, you know, very specific um, platform connected to their website, if it's CD only, no prints, no portfolios, you know, that's the first thing you should do. The other thing, you're in the best city in this country you could possibly be in terms of choices for photography galleries and galleries that show photography. Um, visit regularly. Say hello to the receptionist. They are your gatekeeper. Um, and again, pay attention to the kinds of things they're showing and, you know, find a way to, to ingratiate yourself. You know, you want to be, be kind and, and gentle because, you, again, you got to remember they're inundated every single day. If you get 50 emails a day personally, they probably get 200. So, you know, there's a lot of competition there. Some galleries will allow you to set up an appointment with the owner or the director of the gallery. Um, you usually, if you're lucky enough to get that appointment, you probably have 15 minutes, but it is an extraordinary opportunity. The best thing you can do is have a great resume. Um, you know, make sure, make sure you reiterate your accomplishments, again, this is back to the most important point. You are your most, you are your best advocate. So I know a lot of you are not comfortable being self-promoters, but again, you're the person who can talk about your work best. So don't be shy about your accolades, your awards, where you've shown, who you're already exhibiting with. So that's another thing too. If you're already with one gallery, you know, you could, that, that can be the jumping point to another gallery. Um, some very, very good uh, resumes to look at. One in particular is Richard Moss, M-O-S-S-E. Um, he is on a vertical trajectory, an extremely talented 32-year-old. Um, he has gone out of his way to get his work in front of just about every freelance curator and applied to just about every award. And he already has a Guggenheim. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so does that answer your question? I mean, it's, you know, the, it's a, be persistent without being a pest. Find out what their rules are. Follow them to a T. Um, send them your exhibition cards so that they start getting, you know, regular memory and reminder of you and what you're doing. Um, the other thing too, I don't encourage relying on email. You can, of course, email, but as I mentioned, if you're getting 50 emails a day, they're probably getting 200. Um, phone call, walk in, make it personal. Um, a relationship with a gallery is in fact a business relationship, but it's probably one of the most intimate business relationships you'll ever have. So you make the call and you get the secretary and you ask if you can speak with the, uh, the curator, no? No. You call, you get the receptionist, you say, hi, my name is Mary Louise. And um, I'm a photographer, and I wanted to find out what your submission guidelines are. Do you, do you have a minute to tell me? <coughs> um, so again, the, the receptionist, the people at the front desk, they, they're the nicest people if you're nice to them, and they're your gatekeepers. And so getting your work into an institution can be challenging or it can be easy. To get it purchased can be more challenging than donating. Um, but it does still go through a review committee. Um, it has to go through the curator, and the curator usually makes a case to the acquisition committee that it is additive and beneficial to the museum's collection. I do know that with Houston Photo Fest, 
again, the former curator of photography at the Houston uh, Museum of Fine Arts, Ann Tucker, went regularly, bought regularly. Um, she also has bought work from Radius Books. So Radius Books is a fairly new fine art publication that came on the scene a couple of years ago. Um, their photography books are stunning. And what they do is they sell, you, the artist is participatory in the financing of the publication and they do that through donating work. Radius Books is a 501c3 nonprofit and they sell those prints by the artist to then fund the, the publication. So Radius, for example, has a relationship with collectors as well as institutions. Um, again, it's getting your work acquired by institutions is challenging, particularly in a depression, coming out of a recession. Um, most, most museums do not have the endowments <coughs> of the Metropolitan, MoMA, or the Getty. And even those institutions, those endowments shrunk during the, the recession. Um, so acquisition dollars are contracted. That being said, our institutions in this country would not have the extraordinary photography collections that they do if it weren't for private collections. So the Metropolitan Museum of Art acquired the Gilman Paper Company collection. Um, the Sam Wagstaff collection is at the Getty. The Stieglitz collection is also at the Met, including the Walker Evans archive etc. Um, private collectors are invaluable to museums. So even though your work is acquired by an individual, it may at one point end up in an institution. Now I don't know what state regulations are in New York, but in Oregon, when I sell an artwork to an individual, I am required to reveal the collector to the artist. So it's important for those artists and I let them know, start your contact database because if I disappear, if the gallery disappears, make sure that you stay connected to those who are collecting your work. Yeah. What about corporate there are curators for corporate collections, and that would be a dream job for me. <laughs> Spending somebody else's money. Art fairs. Well, no, you don't find them, they find you. <laughs> Let me backtrack a little bit. Here um, we are. Here we are. Um, so uh, when I've worked with corporate curators, um, they're, they're actually two generations ahead of me generation and a half. Most, most of those curators are actually in their 60s um, and they, they're very, very fortunate. Um, so a lot of investment firms, insurance firms, and what they do, which is very interesting, is when they have a local office, they obviously want to decorate that office. And that's that curator's job to go into the local community and buy artwork, regional artwork, for that office. Um, so, via, so I mentioned the Blue Sky Gallery in Portland, which is a nonprofit. They actually referred um, a corporate curator to me at one point because they, they were opening a new office. The other places that these curators go is art fairs. Again, one-stop shopping. Um, and there was a joke in New York for a while of fair fatigue among the curators because, I mean, there's so many wonderful things happening in the city every other week. 
Um, and many of them would go to Basel, Miami Beach, which is a very big event, usually the first weekend of December. It's a contemporary art fair with a lot of satellite fairs. Um, there is photography there, among other things. So, again, it's back to they find you, you don't find them. In the world of museums and galleries and collections, um, is digital work taken on the same level of seriousness as darkroom uh, prints? And how is pricing negotiated in the world of fine art? digital as opposed to dark because I do both. Okay. Um, that's, that's it's a bit of a quagmire in terms of answering that question. I, I would say what I have found is um, if you're working in digital, if your work is digital, then it's appropriate for that piece. If you're doing reprinting older work that is traditionally darkroom and then making digital carbon pigment prints, you're, you're making a different version of that piece. Um, they're really, what I found is it's not a discrimination, um, but it does need to be crafted to the exceptional levels that it's capable of. Um, for me, uh, what I find is, and for people who, who are sort of new to digital prints and kind of say unflattering things about it, you know, usually because they're not familiar with it, um, in the same way that watercolor is to gouache, is to acrylic, is to oil paint, in our medium, we have daguerreotype, to cyanotype, to photogravure, to gelatin silver, to digital. It's another palette under the same umbrella. Um, so no, there isn't discrimination, but just, you know, again, it's, it's still a craft. You're using different tools, but you still want your print to be exceptional in terms of quality. Um, in terms of pricing, it's got to be appropriate to your market. So if you're just starting, pick out an artist who's comparable to your work, has a similar resume, doing the same type of work, you know, at a lesser known gallery or just starting out in their professional career, but you know, may have some awards or fellowships under their belt, and use that as a gauge because Something is only as worth as much as somebody else is willing to pay for it. Um, do not count your hours. <laughs> You'll always be disappointed. So anyway, it needs to be appropriate to the market and, and comparable work. So museums, galleries, and collectors consider digital, like really high-end digital printing on the same value well, you're, you're comparing, <sighs> yes, in terms of a contemporary photographer, there isn't a discrimination. However, you know, a vintage gelatin silver print of fork and plate by Andre Cortege done on a cart postal is a half million dollar piece that is incomparable to a digital reproduction. So, you know, vintage is very important. The reputation of the artist is very important. And this stems from, you know, my experience as an appraiser. And again, it's, it's also, you know, what people are willing to pay. But vintage, reputation of the artist, notoriety of the image, you know, how many there are, how rare it is, you know, many. The editioning of photographs even though Edward Weston was one of the few people to start editioning his photographs, although very few editions were realized, it wasn't common among photographers until the 1970s when the market really blossomed. Um, you had a, 
a, a flowering of quite a few photography galleries, and many of these dealers would get inventory via estate sales, and then also representing photographers. And it grew, and it was at that time that the dealers were encouraging their artists to limit their work following suit of printmaking. And while with printmaking, the block does wear out and you do want number one versus number 50, dealers who are representing photography still wanted to impart um, rarity and limitation of a particular piece or image. And that's a selling point. And what some artists do is, or their dealers do, is with um, edition prints, they have a tiered price structure, which is a hyper-evolutionary curve of the artist's value. So historically, it's the market that determines the value of your work. If you have a show and all of your photographs on the wall are $1,000 and you sell 10 out of 12, it's time to raise your prices. If you don't sell any, it's you unfortunately have to backtrack, which doesn't look good. Um, and then what tiered price structuring does is if you have an addition of 50, the numbers 1 through 10 are $750. Addition numbers 11 through 20 are $1,200, et cetera, et cetera. So the more popular pieces, as the edition sells out, the price goes up, it generates more dollars for you, and then you have a premium on your final piece. Um, but that doesn't, you know, again, it's based on popularity and how well it's selling. Um, but that is one way to, to increase your value very quickly. So With, editions still hold true in the digital world? Absolutely. In darkroom, you destroy the negative. So no, you don't sure. destroy your negative. <laughs> You do not destroy your negative. Even Brett Weston, for his bravado, put on a show in front of his mantle at the fireplace, did not burn his negatives. Don't destroy your negatives. Um, because someday the Smithsonian might want them. You never know. Um, but when you addition your work, you are essentially declaring a contract between you and the collector. Don't violate it. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You really are. Um, and there are some collectors who hem and haw over, well, I'm not sure why you have an addition of 50 on the 11 by 14s and an addition of 30 on the 16 by 20s when it should be all inclusive. That's actually cleaner bookkeeping. Um, but there are some artists out there where 50 is exclusive of all sizes, um, which is a little harder to manage, but you can do it. Uh, with artists like Herman Leonard, the well-known jazz photographer, he did a brilliant thing, in, in my opinion, in that with his 11 by 14s, it was open edition, unnumbered, available at any time. Price point was very steady for many, many years. It was $600 and then it was $750. But then he additioned his 16 by 20s, those were editions of 50, and his 20 by 24s. And those were very precious, they were very popular, they sold out, I think. They sold out at either 7,500 or 10,000, you know, closer to his death. But that way, because majority of the people who were acquiring a Herman Leonard were not buying a Herman Leonard photograph, they were buying an image of Ella Fitzgerald. You know, so that was, he understood why people were buying his work and that there was you know, another faction of the collectors who appreciated, you know, he's an extraordinary photographer, you know, in addition to having captured Billie Holiday. I may have missed it, but could you explain um, how 
how you define um, fine art photography as opposed to other types of art? Because sometimes I look at things and I'm not quite sure what you call it. Well, one of the things I absolutely adore about this medium is it walks many, many lines. And what some might consider fine art may have started out as photojournalism or fashion photography or social documentary. That's what makes it so great. <laughs> So, and there is, a, there is a, a trend right now, while many photojournalists have been embraced by the fine art world, um, many contemporary journalists are now pushing to get their work into galleries um, because it's getting harder and harder to make a living. So, but here's... They, I guess, you know, ultimately it is a product in the sense that a fine art piece is something that you put on the wall. It's something you wake up to every day. It's, it's decoration. Um, it's uh, intellectually stimulating. But it's, but it's a physical object that you can engage with, whether you frame it, whether you just put a sealant over it if you hang it with, you know, magnets. Um, so it is without question a visual medium. You know, we're starting to, that line's starting to blur when this visual medium is shown on platforms like iPads, which are then mounted to the wall, um, or the, the little digital frames that rotate you know, on your grandmother's desktop or your own desktop. Um, so it's, that's, it's a very, very gray area um, as to what is, is fine art and what is kitsch. You know, it's, you know, it's really taste. I mean, when, when I'm approaching a client about a piece, I mean, for me, it's about matchmaking. Because why live with something you're not in love with? Why live with something you don't want to wake up to every day? Um, you know, but there are, there are individuals who, who think it's important to collect work that represents a certain trend, a certain era, you know, something that's very important in history. And you know, it may, to some people, be ephemera, because you know, it's been used, you know, as a press print or something like that, but, you know, it can be considered art to someone else. So, does that kind of help? <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about signing the, uh, the images on the front, on the back? What do you use to sign it with? Because I've tried a couple of different things, and it doesn't really look all that good. <laughs> Well, if it doesn't look good, I guess it's, n it's not right. Um, so uh, as an appraiser, I've seen many different ways of signing things. Um, what is uh, appreciated by collectors, I'll take, for example, Henri Cartier-Bresson, um, who always very flamboyant, big signature right in the margin below the piece in ink. <laughs> And of course, more often than not, the client wants it framed with the mat exposing not only the image, but of course, the signature. <laughs> and it doesn't have UV glass or plexiglass, and it fades because it's in ink. Um, so that's one issue. Um, but again, the client wants the signature. Um, Many artists like Andre Cortez, for example, would sign on the back of the print in pencil. Um, beautiful signature, very elegant. Um, this is actually preferable from a conservation standpoint because water can be their friend when they're dealing with um, photographs with issues, and pencil is much more stable to deal with. Um, 
What has been very problematic is someone like Brett Weston's work. How many of you remember Crescent Board? That awful, <laughs> it's kind of tan in the middle with the green back. All right, full of acid, absolutely dreadful. Um, fortunately, most of the artists and photographers who are backing their mounting their work on crescent board, the mounting tissue fortunately proved a buffer between the crescent board and the photograph. In some cases it did not, in which case it then infected the artwork. And collectors of his work, for example, um, because he has signed on the mount board, he's trimmed, mounted the piece and signed on the mount board, Avid collectors of his work will pay a conservator to pop off the photograph, put in a one or two ply cotton rag mat, and remount it. You've saved the photograph, you have a buffer, and you've also saved the signature, which is actually a majority of the value at this stage. <laughs> um, and Personally, I think it's distracting to see signature on the overmat. You know, where you have the overmat and then they've signed on, on there. Um, Ansel Adams, he would sign very small, right in the margin. So most of the ones I've seen, it's signed in the margin or it's signed on the back. And usually in pencil, sometimes in ink, but again, you know, experiment with your pens and bear in mind that, that it's light sensitive. Does that help? Okay. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web. <laughs>